So long story short, anyone can do this. I mean, you fast forward just shy of a decade, those skills had allowed me to be responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. You just have to realize introverts can do it, but they have to, they have to fall upon a system because without it, let's just face it, we kind of suck at selling. Next up, representing Primo Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super honored and excited for today's guest. Make sure you guys have your notebooks ready, listening, watching, and rewind and list back and forth as much as you guys need to to take actionable notes so you guys can get results today. Door after door, I was rejected, I was sworn at, I was told to get a real job until the 93rd door where I made my first sale. I remember I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds. Then I had this realization, I'm gonna do this again tomorrow. Specializing and realizing that everyone is not your customer is the key to rapid growth. Yet most people focus on selling to many. People remember 22 times more information when embedded into a story. It short circuits the logical mind and you speak directly to the emotional mind. The emotional mind, however, loves stories. They hear a story and they're like, story time. <laughs> speaking to everyone is speaking to no one. Differentiation is the only important thing or the most important thing to separate yourself from everyone else. And yet it's the thing that most people don't think about. I went from scared to sell to teaching hundreds how to do it. Now, I get the opportunity to teach thousands. Abraham Lincoln used to say, give me six hours to chop down a tree. you will spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. What most people do in their business is akin to just keeping on chopping. It's absolutely time to sharpen the ax. I'm excited to welcome Matthew Pollard. He's young, energetic, contemporary, relatable, an expert in niche marketing, a master of sales, systematic coach. Matthew is passionate also about helping organizations thrive and succeed. With five multi-million dollar businesses, success stories to his name, all before the age of 30. I think he's got me beat. His achievements are reflected in the value and credibility he brings to every presentation. He's not just a theorist. His methods come from hands-on, real-world experience. With over 3,500 business transformations and counting, Matthew provides instant, actionable insights and strategies that make a real and lasting difference to audiences. Matthew is internationally award-winning blogger and contributor to CEO, entrepreneur, and top sales world magazine. He is a reoccurring guest on Fox and NBC and has appeared on top-rated podcasts. He's also the bestseller of The Introvert's Edge, awesome guys, introvert, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell Anyone, which has been endorsed by Neil Patel, Brian Tracy, Mark Roberge of Harvard, Derek Lidwow, Lid, Lidow of Princeton, and dozens more. So I'm excited to welcome Matthew Pollard to Making Bank today. Mate, I'm ecstatic to be here, and thanks for going with the speaker bio. I'm pretty impressed by that. <laughs> Most podcasts are like, yeah, I'm going to say maybe one or two things, but you went all out, so I appreciate that. Hey, it's, it's all good, and uh, you know, we, we like to make it look good for you and just uh, <laughs> show, you who, show the audience who you really are. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, mate. You know, it's, it's been fun. Like most people, when they hear a, um, a bio like that, they're like, there's no way this guy's an introvert, right? There is no way that somebody could speak from stage, you know, you know, be on all these top podcasts, be involved in sales systemization. I mean, how does an introvert actually do that? And the truth is, is one of the things that I just want to start off with, anyone that's listening 
that thinks they're a second class citizen because they're an introvert. The truth is you can actually outsell, out network, out lead, out speak from stage all your extroverted counterparts. It's just your path to success is just different. That's what I discovered and that's what got me to where I am today. So that's what I spend my life sharing. No, and that's super cool because I, 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 you know, for myself, I'm introvert. I've always been introverted and everything. And, you know, it's, I think I'm INTJ on the uh, thing. And so it's like, you know, and people don't realize that when you meet and I've talked to other people and they're like, oh my gosh, I am too. That's so cool. And, you know, so it's exciting. So I'm glad it's, it was super cool when I saw that you were going to come on the show and everything today. Let's kind of dive into a little bit about that and what your life looked like before and, and kind of how that transformation happened and where you're at today. So we'll kind of start back at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think on that, just, so, I mean, firstly, a lot of people do the Myers-Briggs survey and go, oh, I'm an introvert. Like it's a, like it's a, it's a bad thing, right? They're like, oh, now my managers aren't going to take me seriously. Oh, I'm never going to be successful in my own business. I mean, none of that is true. And the one thing I love about coming onto these shows is that people like yourself say, oh, no, I'm an introvert as well. And, you know, look at me, you're listening to me and listening to me interview all these great people. And you probably couldn't tell up until we talked about it today because you're, you plan, you prepare, you get ready for interviews so that you come across, not as an extrovert, because extroverts a lot of times, you know, let's just say sometimes they're not the best listeners, right? Sure. So a lot of times they don't think, they don't listen to what you say. They're ready to ask the next question. And with practice and planning, they can do better at that. And that's the real point, right? We all have our burdens to bear. Some people aren't great listeners. Some people aren't that empathetic, right? Those are introverted strengths. Some people have that in spades, us introverts, but you know, we a lot of times need a system and a process to be better at networking and sales. And gosh, I wish somebody had told me that when I was first getting started. Because I mean, most people that look at me today, they're like, oh yeah, it's easy for you. You know, you're that natural extrovert. You have that gift of gab. Most people don't see me as, you know, how I started. I mean, when I was in late high school, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I was super introverted and I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, luckily enough, and for the video audience here, I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which basically means I put on this funny pair of colored lenses and miraculously, I can learn to read. Now, not like everybody else could, but I could start the process of learning. Sure. So basically what that meant is for literally the last two years of high school, I hustled like crazy and I, I got into the top 10, 20% of my state, but I, I think my family could all see, I mean, I was exhausted. I, I had no idea what I wanted to do and they just knew that I wouldn't stick it out in university if I couldn't figure out you know, what that one direction I needed to go in was. So we all agreed that I was going to take that year off to find myself. I'm sure a bunch of people listening have had kids that have had a year off to find <laughs> themselves, right? We've all heard that. Right. But I wasn't exactly the guy that was going to go travel Europe. My family couldn't afford that. And I definitely wasn't going to sit on the couch and watch Oprah. There was no way my dad, who broke his back 80 hours a week to support the family, was going to be okay with that. So I went away and got a job. Now, the job I got, and this is going to make people laugh, was you know in a real estate agency. But I wasn't the guy in the front selling. I was the guy in the back office doing data entry with a look on my face like, don't speak to me. I'm, I'm here to find myself, right? Well, literally, like it was three weeks in, my manager comes in. He's like, Matt, I am so sorry to tell you this. Like, they've just decided to close down this premise. You're out of a job. Like I'm literally coming into Christmas in Australia. It's summer, it's Christmas break. I mean, Australians go on holidays from the 20th of December to the 15th or 20th of January. No <laughs> one's hiring except for these positions called commission only sales roles, which terrified me almost as much as going home and telling my father, you know, sorry, there's nothing lined up. So I applied for these three commission only sales roles and my confidence was boosted by the fact I got all three interviews. Then I got all three job offers and the job I took was selling B2B sales, and, sorry, B2B sales telecommunications. And I remember going in with a little bit of a, I'm, I'm terrified, but I'm a little bit motivated by the fact that I, I got this job and you know everybody else offered me a job. And he's like, mate, we just hire everyone. Like we've got this saying, we throw mud up against the wall and we see what sticks, which sounds like a fun saying until you realize you're the mud. Well, yeah. long story <laughs> short, I mean, this is just horrible, but. I got thrown on this road called Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia. Literally not a second of sales training, just five days of product training and got told to go sell. And that was my entry into the world of sales. Mm. <laughs> it's like, good luck. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was horrible. I mean, it was 93 doors before my first sale. I mean, it literally, like it was, I went into the, I remember going into the first door and taking a deep breath because I mean, my first realization was no one actually told me what to say. So I had no idea what I was mm -hmm. gonna do. I walked in and luckily, actually, I was politely told to leave. Then I was less politely told to leave. Then I was sworn at. But my personal favorite was always when somebody said to me, why don't you just go get a real job? I mean, this was the only job I could get. 
So door after door, this happened. And I remember the 93rd door, I made about $70. And I was ecstatic for, gosh, probably 45 seconds until I realized my, that I have to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I think a lot of the entrepreneurs that are listening at home, they probably have live in this world of one of two things. And I think the entrepreneur has that kind of, we'll hustle it out, we'll grind it out mentality, which is great if you've got a great strategy. But in truth, I mean, eventually you're gonna run out of energy, you're gonna get exhausted and you're gonna spin out, or you give up, which is what most a lot of other people do. For me, I went, no, there's gotta be another way. So I made this decision, what if there was another solution? Well, the, de- the solution would be sales had to be a sales system. So I literally went out looking for that. And I mean, I remember thinking, oh, I'll pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book. Wait, hang on a second, I can't read. It'll take me a year to read it, let alone apply it. But I stumbled on YouTube and I literally typed in the sales system and all these videos came up. And I'd spend, and this is gonna sound horrible to everyone listening, I spent eight hours practicing at home the first step in the sales process. Then I'd spend eight hours the next day putting it into action. Then I'd go back and spend another eight hours. Literally, it was 16 hour days, weekends I'd spend 16 hours practicing, and that all went on, week on, week off, you know, for the literally week after week. Now, I'm sure this is sounding horrible, but I'd get better. Soon it was 78 doors, then it was 46, then it was 19, then it was 12. I got it down to making a sale on average every three doors. About six weeks in, my manager pulled me aside and I, I thought I was in trouble because I was the quiet guy that used to hand him paperwork downstairs. <laughs> and then all the boisterous sales reps would be upstairs talking about how tough the market was or how they managed to get that client. And he's like, Matt, we just got the national sales figures. And it turns out you're the number one salesperson in the company. I mean, this was the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. They had over a thousand sales reps. And this quiet introvert was the number one salesperson all because he watched YouTube videos and practiced a system. Right, so long story short, anyone can do this. I mean, you fast forward just shy of a decade, those skills had allowed me to be responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. You just have to realize introverts can do it, but they have to they have to fall upon a system because without it, let's just face it, we kind of suck at selling. No, that's uh, so with the system, is that allowing you then? You know, obviously people are introverted; they maybe they don't want to face the ch- fears of talking to other people or. Um, you, you know, or afraid that they'll say the wrong thing or uh, embarrassment or whatever that, whatever that may be resonating with that one person. So then the system that you've followed, but, you know, put together now allows you to overcome those things. Well, there, there are a few things to it. So I think the, the number one thing with introverts, I mean, let's face it, when an extrovert gets rejected, they're like, whatever, next door. Sure. Where an introvert, I mean, we take it also personally, and we're going to beat ourselves up on, over it at nine o'clock at night when we're trying to, you know, rest and relax and we're trying to put on a movie and we're still screaming at ourselves, why did you say that, idiot? <laughs> so we have to learn not to take things so personally. And to do that, if you've got an external system, you know, like Henry Ford, that when he created the mass production vehicle, you know, he didn't say when something came off the line incorrectly, oh my gosh, I was never meant to build cars. So making it external means that we don't take it so personally. But more than that, an introvert tends to, I mean, let's face it, if we don't know what we're going to say, we kind of get stuck in our head and then sure. later we beat ourselves up. So the whole idea of sales systemization, and by the way, this isn't new stuff. Brian Tracy says the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth. Well, the truth is the best people at saying whatever comes out of their mouth are the extroverts and they're also the most likely to brag about it, right? But the top 10% are the ones that have a planned presentation, introvert or extrovert, regardless, which is why people like Zig Ziglar, who you might not know is an introvert, happen to be one of the most well-known sales trainers on the planet, right? Because he had a planned presentation. So what I bring people back to is helping them realize if they plan and prepare, which Mm. introverts are amazing at, they stop worrying about what they are going to say because they've got that all structured, which means that they can be more present during the conversation and then they can channel their natural strengths like active listening and empathy which allow them to be amazing in the room so the sales system really helps them do that but i also talk about leveraging things like story which the science behind story i mean people remember up to 22 times information which is lovely but the thing is that when you tell a story it activates the reticular activating system of our brain what it means is our brains naturally synchronize it creates artificial rapport now 
Obviously, you don't want to live in artificial rapport, but once introverts strike up that initial rapport, they are geniuses in making deeper rapport. So leveraging all of those introverted strengths, all of a sudden, introverts with a plan can be amazing salespeople. And you know, my new book on the introvert's edge to networking talks about applying the same system and process methodology to the act of networking. Because in truth, yeah, sure, you get those transactional networkers that are like those extroverts. Do you want to buy from me? No, what about you? What about you? What about you? It's terrible. Then right. the kind of other networkers gravitate to, well, I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to have these aimless conversations, walk out with a bunch of business cards. They're never going to call me. I'm never going to call them. And then decide networking is a waste of time. Well, going in again with planning and preparation and also knowing your niche and knowing who you're going to speak to and going to the right events, you can be masterful at networking. The truth is, same as the you know, sales, you just have to go in with a strategy that's external to yourself that allows you not to be someone else, not to be more extroverted, because that's a key for success, but the best version of yourself, a well-practiced version. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and no, that makes sense. And, and with that, then, um, having your plan and getting out there, you mentioned, you know, telling stories and, you know, what's uh, obviously when you're going in, you know, people always, they, you kind of always heard in the past, like, oh, if they got a fish on the wall, talk about fishing or, you know, the weather, you know, so what have you found through all your trials and experiences and everything? What's kind of that best connection story that's helped open the door for you? You know, so it depends. So there are different types of stories. So a lot of people focus on, oh, the connection story. But in truth, the best type of story, or what I call the heart of the sale, is when you actually talk. So you, again, you have to have done your planning, right? If you're speaking mm -hmm. to your ideal niche, then your story is always going to apply. Sure. And, you know, we can talk about niching if we get time. But, you know, if you're speaking to your right niche of people, then you're going to have a story that relates to them. So the best thing to do is instead of saying, oh, here's what I do. I mean, the average introvert opens up their fire hose of information and throws all this jargon at someone. And they're like, does any of that work for you? And the guy, the guy or girl shell shock going, oh my gosh, uh, let me think about it, write a proposal, right? Well, by sharing a story of someone you worked with that wanted what they wanted and how you got them to an amazing result, that's gonna be much more powerful. And that is the type of story I'm talking about. Mm. But in truth, absolutely, like, you know, but uh, you're bringing into conversation, you know, I find, you know, some Somebody a long time ago you know, I said to me, you know, you should try mate tea. And I was in South America at the time and I started drinking it. I just, I loved it because it stopped me being so introverted, um, jittery, right? When I was out selling, it was like fight or flight was on hyperdrive with coffee. Well, mate tea kind of leveled me out the whole time. So when somebody, um, when somebody would ask me, um, do I want a coffee? I would say, you know, finally, I, 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 I would love to say yes, but I have to say no. If I drink one more coffee, I'm going to be flying off the, uh, off the walls. I will have a water though. And then as we're getting, you know, they're going to get me a water, you know, I'll be walking with them and I'll say, you know, funnily enough, I actually don't drink coffee at all anymore. I, you know, I had a friend of mine explain to me uh, that, you know, mate tea has a lot more of that consistent energy without the, you know, the ups and downs that coffee tends to provide. And then we get into a whole conversation about how they could never give up coffee and they don't know what's the taste like. And now we're having this whole dialogue, but right. it's always the same of something as ridiculous as do you want to drink, right? So you can create that. But that, that's what I call creating that initial report. And that's actually surprisingly easy. And to be honest, especially in this virtual world that we all live in now around COVID, people want to minimize that. People are no longer accepting hour long meetings. They're like 30 minutes Zoom calls. So actually what happens is when you start that Zoom call, it's actually really great to just be efficient. People like efficiency right now. So what happens is if you get on a call and you, and you tell them that you've done your research, because I hate this, people always get on a call with you and they say, so tell me a little bit about your company. And they think that's developing rapport. And I'm like, well, after checking out my website, my LinkedIn profile, what is it that you don't know that you'd like me to share with you? Like, oh, I haven't checked any of that. And I'm like, well, stop wasting my time. Yeah. I get on a call and I say, well, terrific. Well, while I've had a chance to look at your LinkedIn profile, your website, and the brief notes you left me on the reservation, what I'd like to do is take a step back, hear a little bit more about you, what you're struggling with, and how I can be the most help to you in the time we have together today. Now, all of a sudden, it's all about them. They're really helpful. You know, they're really happy. Oh, thank you so much. They then feel that I've done all my research, mm. so therefore they don't cover the 15 minutes of backstory that I don't want to hear anyway, they then go straight into their actual crux of the problem. And I'm like, oh, okay, so here is where I feel like your major issue is. You know what? Actually, I have an example of this client, Wendy, who had this specific problem. And then I'll go into the story of Wendy and how she had this issue and the realization she made and the outcome. And at the end, I'll say something as simple as, does that make sense? And they'll say, 
oh yeah, totally. I mean, that's exactly what, you know, where I'm at and that's exactly what I'm looking for. Or they'll say just yes. And I say, okay, terrific. Well, at this stage, I can direct you to some amazing free content that'll allow you to continue down this growth, uh, rapid growth journey yourself. Or I can talk to you about what working with me looks like. Do you have a preference? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, oh, talk to me about working with you. And they'll feel incredibly blown away that I suggest that I'm just as happy talking to them about free content. It builds up that law of reciprocity. Now, sure. none of that, in isolation gives value. But if I roll back and tell a story, and again, a great story is not, oh, I worked with a the customer, they wanted this, so we gave it to them. You know, it's ridiculous when people think they tell stories, they don't. I'm talking more of a story about how you met your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, right? You know, when we talk about customers, we're like, oh, they had this, they had this issue and we gave them this outcome. When I tell a story, I, I talk about the theatrical masterpiece that you've created as part of the how we met story, right? Mm -hmm. At the start, when you first told it, you probably knew that a little bit of it was bulky and you cut that out. Then you were like, oh, they enjoyed that. We'll embellish a little bit more. Over time, it's like, I say this, my wife says that, we say that together, we look at each other's eyes, we then look at the person, so that's how we met. Yet in business, we don't do that. What we have to be looking at is bring in what I call emotionally driven content into the stories. So the stories are designed to motivate and inspire action while embedding us as the only logical choice. But if you tell a story in so matter of fact detail, it's like watching the Discovery Channel, right? 10 minutes in, we're bored. But with the emotional content, people can stay on it watching a movie for three hours and still want more. That's because of the emotional content. So what you wanna make sure is you bring that in. You know, I worked with a billion dollar tech company a while back and literally, I do this thing when I speak from stage where sometimes I'll say, so what does a powerful story look like? And then I'll tell a story like I work for their organization sure. and complete with industry acronyms and I'll say at the end, you know, who here thinks I must have worked for the organization for at least 10 years to tell a story in this much detail? Like everybody puts their hand up. Yeah. And then I'll say, well, actually, I, I, I interviewed people for this story like six weeks ago. I wrote it last week. I remembered it yesterday. I'm delivering it today. So if I can do this, what is your excuse, right? And I'm doing this in stage in front of thousands of people. But sometimes I've got to interview people and to get this story. And I remember sitting with this tech company and literally I interviewed seven people and this was an interrogation would have been putting this lightly. 45 minutes I interviewed them and I literally gave them the story back in 45 seconds. They're like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? That was so much more compelling. And I said, okay, well, I'm glad you like the story. And by the way, this story structure is literally available in chapter five of my first book or chapter four of my second book. But I said, here are the things that I don't, I don't get. You said you worked with the, uh, the head of IT. What was the person's name? And they're like, oh, um, it was David. I'm like, here's the problem. When you talk about the head of IT, I can't feel the problems of the head, head of IT. But when it comes to David, I can feel it all. Talk to me about David. Secondly, you said you've been chasing them to go into the cloud for years. All of a sudden they changed their mind. Why? They didn't know. They had to go away and find out. Turns out this was a government organization and had this, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. Well, it did broke. And it, sorry, it did break and it broke just around Christmas time and they couldn't run payroll because the system was down. Thousands of government workers and David was the guy that couldn't pay them. David was the guy that ruined Christmas. So why do you think he wanted to move into the cloud later? So he was never the person responsible for ruining Christmas for everyone, driving all of his team to stay in over Christmas, probably all worried about losing their jobs while their family is annoyed with them because they're missing Christmas, trying to make sure payroll runs before New Year's Eve. That's a huge piece of information, this emotional journey. I worked with a gym franchise and they're like, oh, so this person wanted to lose weight. They tried to cancel their membership. We reminded them that they wanted to lose weight. We gave them a fitness regime and then all of a sudden they stayed and now they're really happy. I'm like, why were they trying to lose weight? Turns out she was trying to get pregnant. Well, I'm like, well, do you think she felt like she was letting her family down? How are the grandparents now about the fact that they're going to be grandparents? How is this not part of the story? The stories that you tell usually are so one dimensional and you need to build them out to entice people to go, oh my gosh, this person understands the unique situation I'm in and they can tell that through the story. Not they understand the, the problem and they understand what I need, but they understand me. And when they, when they feel that, all of a sudden they feel they've got this deep and rich connection with you. And they don't care what you're selling at that point, they want it. No, that's huge. I think um, you mentioned that you know, kind of like using names and uh, emotional ties in with that. Um, what are maybe a couple other key points? I, I, I know you mentioned them when you were talking, not the specific key points, but I could hear them in the story that you intertwined in there that really helps lock that in place. Yeah, absolutely. And so to me, a good story, it has four elements to it. So you have 
the problem that they have or the outcome that they're looking for is if you think step one, then okay. you, and by the way, most people don't really cover anything in that. They skip over that and get to their favorite part, which is the implementation where they're the hero. They came in and they whatever. fixed yeah. this. <laughs> jargon, 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 right? Then they say, oh, and then they were happy at the end, which is the outcome. And then they skip the next step, which is the moral of the story. You know, I, I think the moral is super important because, you know, people's perceptions are different based on, you know, their upbringing, the, I mean, what they had for coffee in the morning, right? They just, you know, everything shifts the perspective that we have. So I like to break the entire thing into four quadrants. And I like to say the moral is so vital because what they think, what you think is obvious that is the is the moral of the story maybe totally different to them and you know i remember watching this tv show scrubs and at the end this character jd used to always summarize the tv show in the last 60 seconds of the show and i used to love that because sometimes it was like oh i didn't get that from that that show at all <laughs> so i really enjoyed it but here's the thing i find in section one the problem and section three the outcome most people keep it let's just say very, very bland and boring. So I like to break it into three elements, both of these elements. So what I do is I focus on real cost of the problem, opportunity cost of the problem, and the out, uh, sorry, the emotional cost of the problem. And then at the end, was the real cost realized? Was the opportunity cost realized? Is the person feeling better? Are they happier? Are they sleeping better? Are they less stressed? Best example I can give you of this is, gosh, years ago now, this was in my last educational company. We were out selling electricity, uh, sorry, we were out selling business education and our primary niche was electricians, right? So we grew it out to tradespeople on a trade site, anyone, then florists and hairdressers were tradespeople too, and then doctors and lawyers, right? So we ended up selling to three and a half thousand students in three years. But when we first started, it was just electricians. And I remember, I mean, I always will go out and sell something myself before I let anyone else on my team sell it, or before I hire people, which by the way, if you're interested you're like, I'll just hire a salesperson, they'll go and sell it, and, and then I'll be rich. Well, truth is, they're just gonna sell to you for the next six months. Oh, it's an opportunity, here's my pipeline, it's growing, and then you'll get nothing, and then six months later, you're blown through 75 grand. You're like, well, how did this even happen? Right. So don't think that's the way it's gonna be. So I always sell what I do first so that I know you know, whether or not my salesperson's perhaps not lying to me, but whether they've lying to themselves, and whether or not the, the market's changed, I can go and check six months later, a year later. Well, when I was selling electricity, I remember going out and it was like a 45 minute drive out to this appointment that I'd set myself in Lilydale in Melbourne, Australia. And I remember sitting down with this guy and I got to the point where I said, so, you know, one of the things I'd love to know is what problems that you're experiencing in your business. Go, oh, we don't really have any problems. Well, I only work with electricians, so I know their problems better than they know it themselves. So because of that, I remember saying, you know, really because the, the last 60 electricians that I've spoken to in the last two months have this problem, this problem, this problem. You sure you don't have any? And usually that's always them going, oh yeah, I have those and I've got all of these. Well, not this guy. He's like, no, nope, don't really have any of those. So in my head, I'm like, gosh, I've spent 45 minutes coming out to see this person. Really, you don't have any problems at all. This was more of a desperation plea. And he's like, well, you know, if, if I think about it, maybe the worst part is that my staff really don't clean up after themselves. So I'm just right, jump straight on that, right? Well, how are you seeing that as a problem? And they're like, well, I mean, you know, occasionally I gotta send them back. You know, I'm talking about real costs, right? You know, occasionally I gotta send them back. Well, how much is that costing you? Well, what are you talking about, mate? Like it happens a few times a month. You know, maybe I gotta send them back a couple of hours here and there, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars a month, but it's, it's annoying, I guess. And I'm like, okay, in my head, I'm like trying to sell thousands of dollars worth of training, a few hundred dollars a month. Maybe we'll cut it, but probably not. I said, all right, let's move. So this is the world of real cost. I then moved on to opportunity cost. And I said, let me ask you a question. Do you ever go and see people? Like, do you ever go out and do electronic, uh, like electrical work yourself? He goes, yeah, yeah, from time to time. I go and see maybe 10 clients a month. I said, do you ever get any referrals? He's like, oh yeah, of course. If I go to see 10 people, I'd probably get about three referrals. So let me ask you, are they usually smaller jobs or bigger jobs? He goes, no, nah, they're always the bigger jobs. Like probably off those referrals, I'd probably make about $1,000 each. So, and I'm like, okay, so about $3,000 every time you do 10 jobs. He said, yeah, about that. I said, do your staff ever go and see, uh, you know, get referrals? He goes, no, nah, they'd be lucky to get maybe one or two. I said, how many people do they see? Oh, at least 40 a month. I said, let me get this right. They're seeing 40 a month, but they're getting one or two referrals. So let's call it two. So they're getting about $2,000 in referrals. But if you were to say, not saying you'd have the time to, but if you were to go and see those 40 people, you would make closer to 12. Is it fair to assume that your staff are losing you $10,000 a month in referrals? Maybe because they're not cleaning up after themselves and a lot of people aren't telling you. It's like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. I said, let me ask you another question. How many staff do you have? He's like, five. I said, so you could be losing $50,000 because of this? 
So, oh my gosh. I said, are you paying ads to try and get new clients? He's like, we are. I said, how much are you spending on ads? He's like, about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a month. I said, so maybe $63,000 you are losing. Now, that's opportunity cost, by the way. Now I'm gonna move into the emotional cost. I said, is it annoying you that you could be losing $63,000 because your staff aren't cleaning up? He's like, well, it does now. I said, <laughs> that was a huge point for him, right? But not as huge as this. I said, do you ever get to a Friday night and you can't get on the phone to one of these staff members when they haven't cleaned up and you're the one that ends up having to go out? He's like, it happens all the time. He said, my wife and my daughter aren't talking to me right now because I just missed a dance recital on Friday night and I couldn't go. I mean, but one bad review on Yelp or, or Google, if I hadn't have gone out right there and then, that would have been it for our business. I said, I totally get that, mate. I said, but you have to understand that this all could be probably because of the fact you haven't got customer service training. You're losing 63 grand plus the staff cost, plus your kids aren't talking to you. How soon do you want to fix this problem? Straight away. Now, when I go to networking events, this is the story I tell because later down the track, yes, of course, he saved a small amount of money about the cleaning up, but he didn't get all the referrals, but he got about 30, 35,000 of the 50, and he didn't have to market anymore, so he saved that 13,000 too. And now he gets home on a Friday night, he's never missing the kids' footy games, he's never missing the kids' dance recitals. So when I'm out networking, when somebody says, oh, we don't really have a problem, I would tell that story. And the moral of the story was, sometimes the most expensive problems are the ones you don't even see. So are you sure you don't want to talk about this a little bit more? How do you not get a person to go, oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. And it's the kids' dance recital, which is what really gets them to listen. It's what makes it real, because the rest is just money. And while I can say, I mean, that's I mean, $600,000 a year, I mean, gosh, that more than doubled his income. In truth, yeah. that's not enough to get them to do it right away. It's enough for them to consider it, to ask for a proposal, to forget about it, to put it off for the next six months. Mm, yeah, and then moving into that next part with family and everything else, that's what seals it right there for you. Absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, we got a few minutes left. I, it was like, whoa, that was like, <laughs> went crazy fast. <laughs> um, so with that, so we have, um, you know, this, how, how, what's the best way then to take that and then translate that into like a digital experience? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, when, are you talking about um, on From like an e-commerce standpoint. Yeah, so okay. Like on a website, whatever that may be. Because um, obviously, then we're not directly interacting face to face, one on one. Um, how can we take and break that down, and then re be able to put that on the website or from on a, a sales page or a lander page or whatever that may be, and then get present have that same message kind of communicate out there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting, you know, I get big, you know, while I spend most of my time helping introverted service providers, you know, because my passion is really about helping small business, I get a ton of corporates and, you know, I'll be talking to the marketing and the sales team and the marketing team will be like, how do we find these great stories? I'm like, your sales team's right there, ask them. And the sales team are like, they just think in customer segments, they don't really understand it. So, you know, usually marketing and sales don't really like each other. So if you're right. from a big company thinking about this, you need to first understand what the stories are, are real people. So you need to go and ask them. If you are your own business and you have the opportunity to do both, then what you really need to be thinking about are still what are your customers' best success stories? What are some of the stories of application that you have? And you know what's really interesting is, if, I mean, if you do webinars, stories are hugely powerful in webinars. Yep, if sure. your goal is to drive people to your products and services through things like podcasts, well, what do you know? I just did that with a bunch of stories in a podcast like this, right? So there's lots of different ways you can do it. You can use stories when in, in Facebook video ads, in LinkedIn video ads, in Instagram video ads. Uh, the other thing a lot of times I find is, you know, people will talk about customer experiences. So what you want to be doing is, you know, talking, you're know, going through and showing people the product, but telling a story of someone they were just talking with mm. that had a great experience right. with the product so instead of saying so this product does this talk about how it affected that other person's life or how much they got out of it or how much their kids got out of it so you want to build in a narrative to everything you do otherwise whatever you do just comes across as jargon so there are a ton of ways to do it I mean you can even you know I work with a, um, a, a well, one of the big it, it, the companies are one of the largest telecommunications companies in middle America and you know they were like how can we build these stories into chat because chat doesn't allow you to, you don't want to give people sure. blasts of these long stories. <laughs> and so one of the things I do with my, with, with, with my small business clients is I get them to write a core blog post, which literally has 
three stories in it. Basically says, hey everyone, I understand your unique problems. Let me tell you how to get overcome that. Here's the first problem you have. Here's the solution. Here's a story with the problem that I gave the solution. Here's the outcome. We do that three more times and there's a conclusion. However, for these chats, a lot of times people are like, I've got this really big problem. I'm really annoyed with you. Or I want to do this or I want to do that. And they're like, well, have you considered doing this? While I'm checking out your account, click on this link and watch this three minute video. By the time we get back, um, I want to. I'll, I'll love to know if this is the right fit for you, or whether you want me to still consider doing what you suggest. Now, of course, what else am I going to do for that three minutes while I'm sitting there waiting for the chatbot to check my details? Right? I'm going to check my emails, but this is more. This is more present. So I'm going to watch that video. And I'm going to check it. Now, of course, in, in, what you'll find is in chat, 30 seconds, 40 seconds in, people are like, "Hello, are you still there?" Like, so all of a sudden, you've given them homework to do that keeps them engaged. You're telling them the story, which, by the way, short circuits the logical mind. You speak directly to the emotional mind. So two and a half minutes, and they're still not going to. Tr- trigger that you haven't got back to them yet. So it's an amazing advantage. So there are so many different ways to use story, you know, when you're talking about in a digital experience. The problem is, again, most people just they just want to talk about and I understand, you know, I, I, I love, you know, sales pages that follow like the, the pasta format, you know, where you, where you talk about the problem, you, you agitate them and you, you then go into the solution. But the, the problem is that when you do testimonials, it's more like, you know, here's what one person said. Bring right. in some real stories. If you're going to put testimonials, put videos with these people sharing a narrative about how they applied it, not just where they were at and the outcome that they got. Talk about the fact that the problem before felt like they were struggling and they had felt this pressure on their chest. And now, you know, the, the sky looks different. The air feels different. It's a different life. You can build out this colorful testimonial, which to them, you know, with a little bit of guidance will be absolutely true because that is the yeah. transformation. Stay out of the logical. Mm, that's awesome. No, that, that's amazing guys i hope you guys are really taking notes listen to what matthew was talking about he's dropping so many amazing insights for you guys today go back listen watch this again like we said in the beginning and then start applying it you can take it for real world applications one-on-one working with clients as well as he just spun out some awesome stuff that you can use right now for the digital side your econ business even customer service making sure your customers are happy you know connecting with them and you know making making them feel like you are definitely you know listening to them and helping them out with a solution so great insights there I uh, really appreciate you coming on Making Bank today. What's one last thing you're like, oh, man, I was hoping Josh was going to ask me this, but we got all crazy all over the board on these other areas. Uh, what's one last thing you want to let everybody know about, and then where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the one thing that I would really recommend to everybody is that when we talk about systems for networking, systems for sales, and look, while I'm the first one to probably come out there and say introverts make the best salespeople, the best networkers, I'm also not the only. I mean, Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group, 10,000 membership groups across the country, is a personal friend of mine, and he's an introvert. Zig Ziglar is an introvert. So the truth is there are other experts that are introverted that you can learn off, but make sure you learn off an introverted expert. The second thing is do not learn sales, networking, public speaking like martial, mixed martial arts, right? It gets confusing. Focus on keeping it simple, right? Forget about all the bells and whistles. Follow the Henry Ford methodology. He used to say you can have any color car you want as long as it's black because he didn't want to get involved in anything else outside making sure the production line ran smoothly. And then once he did, then he he offered other things into the, the vehicles that you now see today. But the truth is you've got to start by just focusing on one system, one methodology. And in regards to how people can find out more about me, I mean, I would suggest you start there. So, you know, firstly, by the way, we can only cover a touch, a small amount of what you know I, I yeah. cover in, on my YouTube channel. So you're welcome to go to YouTube, and there's a ton of free content. I learned on YouTube, so I repay the favor heavily by providing a huge amount of value there. Connect with me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, on, on Facebook. I provide a ton of free videos out that way as well. But what I would really recommend people doing is checking out uh, my books, The Introvert's Edge and The Introvert's Edge to Networking. And my publisher hates me when I say this. You don't need to buy my books. If you go to theintrovertsedge.com, you'll be able to download the first chapter of my sales book. And there I literally outline the seven steps to a sale. And if you do nothing more than look at what I currently say, put what you currently, sorry, the seven headings, put what you currently say into that. Firstly, you'll realize some things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying that to clients. Then you'll realize there's some things out of order and then there's some gaping holes, usually around asking the right questions and, and telling great stories. If you do nothing more than fill in those gaps and fill up the structure, 
you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. And again, that's at theintrovertsedge.com. My second book, you can download the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. And again, I give you the same structure. Again, if you just follow the system, you'll easily, and I would say you'll forex your networking because most introverts are pathetic networkers. And in truth, you can be amazing at it as long as you stop ignoring that you've got to go and then begrudgingly walk in completely unprepared. That is a you know, an absolute strategy to fail. And it's the reason why you walk out thinking networking doesn't work and you always end up talking to that insurance salesperson, that a real estate person that you don't want to be talking to. So if you do some planning beforehand at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking with that free chapter, you will transform your networking overnight. Awesome. Uh, thanks again for coming on Making Bank, Matt. I appreciate your time here. Guys, again, grab his book. The link's right down here. Uh, start applying what we talked about today. And like I said, listen to this. Share this with somebody that you know that, can, that needs help with this or that's an introvert that can help them pop out of their shell and really you know, follow some systems that will help move them forward in their business and their personal life or wherever they're needing that extra little bump. So, again, thanks for coming on Making Bank today. My absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me on. I am Josh Felbert. You were watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary.